Today's episode of the Meat Eater Podcast was brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com. Enter the offer code MEATEATER, one word, MEATEATER, at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace, build it beautiful. All right, everybody, this is the best news to ever happen in the entire history of, of everything. Individual Meat Eater episodes from our new season, I'm talking the TV show, not this here podcast, are available for instant streaming and HD downloads right after they air on TV. So you get a new episode every Thursday. There's no embargo, you know, where you got to wait a long time to get a new episode. It comes out on TV, you go to your computer, you watch it on your computer, no problem. Head over to meateater.vhx.tv to instantly watch the new season of Meat Eater in HD. Use the promo code Meat Eater Podcast at checkout and you get five bucks off any of our previous volumes. Go check it out. Prime viewing for you. Hey everyone, this is the Meat Eater Podcast. We're, we're broadcasting. I was to say broadcasting. It's, just, it's, a, it's not quite the right word. We're recording for almost immediate broadcast. In the governor's mansion in Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, this town is uh, the place where Tom Horn drew his last breath. You guys familiar with Tom Horn? We are. Yeah. You're Tom, right. I wrote about Tom Horn one time, and Tom Horn was this guy who got kind of caught up in the wrong century. He was a livestock detective in the late 1800s, and he developed a methodology that wasn't as acceptable in the early 1900s and got himself into a whole bunch of trouble, was the last man legally hung in Wyoming. Um, interesting, ultimately tragic tale, but don't steal cattle is the, the, the moral of the story there. Right. And if someone does take your cow, be calm. Be calm and, and getting it back. Um, we're joined. We have a very special guest. We have the governor of Wyoming, Governor Matt Mead, and we're joined as well by Nephi Cole and Dave Wilms, who are natural resource policy advisors. Rourke Denver's here. People who've watched the media or television show will know Rourke, author of Damn Few, Making of the Modern Seal Warrior, author of a, you just put the finishing touches on another book? Just this week. Really? Yep. Can you tell us what it's called? It's a little bit of a fight yet, but I think it's going to be called Worth Dying For. When's it coming out? Hopefully spring of 16. So worth dying for a Navy SEALs call to a nation. I think uh, everyone in this room is going to enjoy it. Hopefully, Ooh, that's uh, tight. That's enticing. Well, yeah. And joined also by, uh, by Giannis Van, Yanni Van Zwaal, who tell us. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk today. I'm sure a lot of stuff will come up, but particularly I want, we're going to talk about a, a handful of wildlife issues in What's cool about being able to do this in Wyoming is the governor of Wyoming, who's sitting here to my right, has what I would consider to be the good luck of governing in a state where you get to think about and deal with wildlife yeah, on a daily basis. Well, uh, thanks for being here, Steve. And Rourke, what a privilege to have you here as well. Uh, it's, you, a, it's a good day in the governor's mansion in Wyoming to have you both here. Appreciate you making the travels. Uh, so this morning, just... Uh, highlight a little earlier what you said there. I, I started, to, my wife and I have a ranch about 90 miles from here. It's on the Colorado-Wyoming border. And uh, got, I love to get up early in the morning. This morning we were able to see moose, we were able to see deer. and uh, But the ranch is one of the oldest uh, ranches in Wyoming. Uh, we've had it for about 15 years. But the guy that uh, started the ranch was N.K. Boswell. And N.K. Boswell, there's a couple of books on one, it's called Frontier Lawman. And he was a legendary lawman in the territory of Wyoming. And in the barn that we still have, reportedly there is there was two uh, horse thieves hung from that barn. So is that right? yeah, cattle rustling and stealing horses was not a good deal of back in the day. Yeah. And so glad to have you both here and uh, eager to talk about wildlife issues. So thank you. Yeah, for start, you grew up um, 
in Wyoming and in a in a in a ranching family in the in the Grand Teton area, right? Yeah, my uh, great grandparents homesteaded uh, in Teton County in Jackson, commonly called Jackson Hole, and uh, homesteaded there. Uh, homesteaded there. Is that right? So my great grandparents, grandparents, parents, uh, and now my brother and my sister and I were all in the ranching business, although I have this temporary job as in politics, but we'll get back to ranching. Uh, Do they still work that same land now? Yeah, family? my brother yeah. runs uh, the family ranch there, and uh, it's, uh, you know, I know we're going to talk about wildlife, but it's a cattle ranch, and uh, my brother and uh, his wife still raise cattle there, as did my great-grandparents, and so on and so forth, and I recall, uh, you know, growing up, granddad, when we were eating beef, uh, at dinner or something, he would talk about what a luxury it is. And uh, he said, you know, when we were growing up, we never got to eat beef, even though they were cattle ranchers, because uh, that was for people who could afford beef. That's for sale, yeah. And he said, we lived on elk. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, now people look at it like that they were, you know, this is the higher dollar item. Um, you do some hunting still, even though you have obviously a lot of demands on your time. You recently were involved in the in the one shot challenge. I think you were the, weren't you the first guy to talk about one shot challenge. I, I, I have a uh, I have a friend. We'll, we'll talk about it at some other point. That just tried to grab me another uh, a seal seal sniper buddy of mine to come up and, and, and compete in that competition and, and are still talking about it for next year. So I think uh, that, I, I would the guy from Colorado because uh, they I, need help. No. I saw the scoreboard. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't. I saw the scoreboard. <laughs> Colorado <laughs> was the only team. All right, can, can you, do you, Governor? Do you mind breaking down with the one? shot challenges no i, I don't I, I i guess starting out work we would have, love to have you on a team let me Thank just say you. i think it was three years ago uh for the for the first time the one shot which is limited to eight teams three person on a team uh for the first time had a wounded warriors team and it incredible uh, because these guys showed up and one of the guys had a um uh, open sights, iron sights, and with the day before the hunt, you go to the range and you have these little competitions. And I knew we were in trouble because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even see what he was looking at with my scope, my fancy scope, and he's hitting this thing. Uh, and it couldn't have been a better story. They they won the whole thing. Oh, there. Right? And so, uh, and every year since then, we've had a wounded water team. But yeah, so the one shot is um, it's the 75th year. Uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of the one shot. Uh, there's been some remarkable people that have participated in. It's co-hosted by Colorado and Wyoming, and there's a friendly competition between the two states on uh, who does better. Co-hosted by the Fish and Game Agencies, right? Well, it's it's done by Wyoming and the Shoshone Tribe, but the it's always been the partnership between Colorado and Wyoming. In other words, the Wyoming governor and the Colorado governor. I got you. Uh, yeah. Each get to have their own team, and so it creates some uh, fun competition. And uh, it's a timed event. Uh, it's not a trophy hunt. In other words, uh, you see how uh, first you got a hit, and you truly only get one shot. Now, if you wound your animal and doesn't go down, and you're required to take a second shot, then you're out of the competition. That's counts. Yeah, it's like you never shot that's, at that, all. That's a miss. That's a miss. So it's uh, how quickly uh, your three teammates can uh, get an antelope with one shot. No rests allowed. Um, Unless God put it there. If you're lucky enough to be on a brush or a rock uh, where your shot is, then you can use that. Can't use a sling, can't use a rest. And for a lot of hunters, you know, they're very good hunters. They're used to using artificial rests, and it creates a little more uh, uh, dynamic when it's one shot, no rest, timed event. So we had a good year this year. Uh, two out of our three teammates uh, hit. Uh, I uh, was uh, My third teammate was a Colorado guy, Todd Helton. And uh, he came up, and uh, he was very into it. And he hit his antelope, but it didn't go down right away, so he had to take a second shot. So, so it was the Colorado guy that spoiled it for you. <laughs> we, uh... You know, Giannis identifies very strong with Colorado. <laughs> he he kind of came of age in Colorado. Rourke now, I don't know if Rourke, you might, people know where you live. Rourke uh, I'm has, spending time in Colorado. Spends time yeah, in Colorado. Yeah. Um, so who was the winner, though? The winner, uh, well, I, I got to, because I, before I announce the winner here, I want to tell you that, uh, so Governor Higginlooper has been great about this, and so his first year in the event, which is my first year, he was so impressed with the event, he put together a traveling trophy, which is from Colorado Silver and Wyoming Gold, and uh, a very nice uh, gesture. He's a great sport on the whole deal, uh, but 
since the first year he made this, uh, so five years ago, uh, it's never left Wyoming's borders. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> having said that, uh, the Colorado team, uh, the, there was a Colorado team called Mile High Shooters, and all three hit, and so they won this year. So yeah. Colorado did well that way, absolutely. I like that it promotes um, t- taking your time and making a shot. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, and I tell, you know, when people who haven't hunted before, they're like, you know, any advice? I'm like, one is you're going to get on antelope. There's no question about it. There's a lot of antelope. Two is uh, you've got to be patient and take your time. Now, there's been, like last year, I didn't follow my own advice. I was on an antelope, like, within five minutes, and it was, I'm embarrassed to say how close it was. It was one of those, there's no way to miss. Mm-hmm. I shot. And the antelope didn't even flinch. And so <laughs> this year I, I did, I was very patient. And it took me about, um, you know, a little over five hours to find the shot that I wanted. I had some other shots, but I just, you know, you want to make sure. So, yep. uh, and the guides are great. You know, they, um, they let you take the time and be patient and make sure you make a good, clean shot that uh, puts the animal down. So, Oh, I, we do need to move on eventually, but so how's this deal now, Rourke? Someone asked you. I, to I, do had it? A, I had a professional speaking event that actually connected me to a gas oil firm. The the CEO of the company he keeps a home in, ja- uh, home in Jackson, and he called me about. It. I'd never heard of the competition before, and he said, "You got to look this up. Go to the website." I checked it out, and so he wants to. Uh, I, I think, if I understand correctly, they, they get to sponsor and kind of bid into the process or apply to be a team in the competition. And he asked me. He said, "You know anybody that shoot?" suit state and i said i i know a few people that can do that and so we uh we thought we might put a uh try and put a team together so we missed this year i think you want to try and do it next year based on this podcast maybe i've got another avenue into the competition so life's looking good for the for the one shot right now well uh Rourke, uh we love having good shooters on the team so i believe it i believe it yeah. one of the one of the things that really makes the hunt special is so i get to choose one teammate and then the association, the One Shot uh, Association, chooses a local guide. And a lot of these local guys, work have been on, you know, they've volunteered for 25, 30 years. And so, Steve, when they get their chance to hunt, you know, I feel pressure. But those guys, it's a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime deal for them. Yeah. And everybody in that town knows i mean they go back oh. hey i see your uncle hit your grandfather hit <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what happened to you yeah and so it's a lot of pressure but it adds you know it adds so much to it to have those those local people who volunteered you know i talked to a guy today or last uh, this year on the hunt who's been volunteering for 45 years at that event and so it's a very special event that way and then when those guys get their chance i mean you know, everybody feels the sort of the pressure, but those guys, <laughs> it's a big, big deal. Did you say they've been doing it for 75 years? 75 years. This is the 75th anniversary. So it's it's a great tradition. And there, you see, you know, I, I participate uh, in the Grand National Quail Hunt uh, when I can. That came out of uh, the one shot. You, a lot of these competitions around the country uh, were patterned after the one shot antelope hunt. Okay, I want to jump in. I don't, I don't want to waste a bunch of time here. I want to jump into into uh, let's start by talking about the ESA now for hunters fishermen people who like to spend time outdoors um the, the, kind of the quickest avenue for you to get into thinking about the ESA and danger species act would be to kind of think about some of these things that are in the news constantly for the last or some of these species that are in the news constantly for the last decade and, and in particular we'll, we'll kind of focus on three big charismatic critters um when you're hearing about grizzly bears and what we're going to do with grizzly bears and grizzly bear management the gray wolf okay all the news constantly coming out of the northern great lakes of the greater yellowstone area northern rockies about gray wolves how we're going to manage if we're going to manage gray wolves and then most recently all things you've been hearing about or should have been hearing about with the sage grouse um what we're going to do about sage grouse, how are we going to, how were we going to go about preventing the collapse of this? These are all animals that are traditionally game animals, you know, th- things that have been hunted for, will be hunted for again. And I want to lay a little bit of groundwork on what the ESA is, just so people can kind of get what we're talking about when we start talking about where the ESA stands right now and some problems that, that are, are occurring around it. So this goes back 
you know, longer than I've been alive. Nixon, you know, signed the ESA in. What it was meant to do was meant to save species that were being uh, driven to extinction through, through factors involving economic growth and development. Okay, so human-caused things. And at the time, in the 70s and, and prior to that, we were having almost like an, an epidemic of near extinctions. And it was when they came in with the ESA is that we were going to prevent these things at whatever cost necessary. And by that, I mean like whatever economic cost to try to halt these things. It's administered by two agencies. So the U S fish and wildlife service and then NOAA or national oceanic and atmospheric administration kind of in your day-to-day existence. You definitely have a lot more to do with U S fish and wildlife service. Like if you're a waterfowl hunter, um, you know, waterfowl is managed on federal and state level. That's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that it plays a big part in waterfowl management and other migratory things. Um, 99%, they say, this is a debatable thing, but it's, it's argued that 99% of the animals that have been listed, 99% of the animals that have been listed have been saved from extinction. Now, that doesn't mean that, that, that the act necessarily saved them from extinction, but 99% of the things that have been listed still exist on Earth. All right. When an animal gets listing, it, it, it gets a lot of protections for it and its habitat, and it can curtail and change human behaviors. Um, when something would get removed from the list, it's because a handful of criteria are met where you have the, the population has reached stability and growth. You've removed or put a control on the things that were threatening it in the first place, and then you have the stability of habitat quality. We list things that aren't just in the U.S. So there's 2,000 species that have ESA protection, foreign and domestic. About 60 have been delisted. Okay, 30 of the species that have gotten protection have been delisted due to outright recovery. All right. Um, 10 have been delisted due to extinction though the bulk of those were probably already extinct when they got listing. Like it was, we knew that there might be some left. Like there's this bird, for instance, um, ivory billed woodpecker for a long time. It was like, maybe it's not extinct. Maybe it exists somewhere. And now it's relatively certain that the bird's gone. So, you know, it could have been extinct at the time of listing and, and you have things like that happen. And then a handful of things were delisted because researchers revealed that the thing didn't belong there in the first place, either because they discovered a new population. So they thought that they had some very limited number of an animal or a bird discovered that, in fact, it inhabits these areas we didn't realize it inhabited. It's not at risk of genetic extinction, so it's pulled off. Or, as happens sometimes, you get better data and you learn that you were wrong. Animals are very hard to count. Even something as big as a grizzly bear, you cannot get people to agree on population estimates because it's hard to count animals. Um, so sometimes new data will come and, and, and a thing will get delisted. Some examples of things that you'd find on the endangered species list, bald eagle, whooping crane, the peregrine falcon, key deer, gray wolf, red wolf, black-footed ferret, southern sea otter. Some quick pros and cons. A pro of the Endangered Species Act. If someone was sitting here arguing the pros of the Endangered Species Act, they'd be like, hey, it works. 30 of the species that have gotten listing have recovered. If someone was here to argue the cons, they would say only 30. We've had 2000 listed. So you've recovered 1% over the 30 year history of the endangered species act. You're, you've got 1% recovery. So it's not entirely working. Um, that, that's sort of a general background. I want to focus in on Are one of you guys here comfortable giving like a brief synopsis focused on Wyoming to just kind of bring listeners up to speed on what has happened with the roller coaster ride of gray wolf listing delisting. Yeah. Well, I can take a crack at it first, uh, Steve, great summary of the oh. endangered species act. Uh, as you said, in 1973, uh, president Nixon signed into law and the intent, uh, to save those species that are threatened or endangered, you know, people don't disagree with that. I, I think, particularly here in the West, uh, we value wildlife. It adds to our quality of life. 
but the gray wolf is a good example of what, in my mind, is not working with the Endangered Species Act. Before I came into office, the state had struggled with this issue uh, for many years, about a decade, on what to do with the gray wolf, including the fact that, remember, that the gray wolf uh, was reintroduced into Yellowstone. In other words, we went and grabbed a, a, a herd of gray wolves and, and put them in Yellowstone. So they're not... Uh, worldwide, they're not this species that is on the verge of extinction. I mean, they were available, we put them in Yellowstone, and they are tremendous predators. And when you put them in Yellowstone, which is a national park next to another national park, Grand Teton National Park, where you have all these game species that have, you know, great levels of protection, they're naturally going to thrive, and they have. And so when I came into office, you know, we wanted them delisted. We wanted them delisted, one, because the population showed that they are more than stable. Uh, two, when you have runaway population of predators, it hurts other game species, for example, deer, moose, elk. It uh, causes uh, conflict with uh, livestock, uh, sheep, uh, and cattle in particular. And so we wanted to gain a balance. We didn't want to wipe them out. We wanted to say, you know, how can we find an appropriate balance? And I worked directly one-on-one -on -one with Secretary of Interior Salazar on that issue, along with the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, along with ranchers, conservation groups, environmental groups, and we came up with a plan that uh, we felt very comfortable was going to provide the protection needed for the wolves, but bring into balance and the ability for the state of Wyoming to manage that which belongs to the state of Wyoming, which is our wildlife. Um, and. Secretary signed off on it, Fish and Wildlife signed off on it, I signed off on it, and it worked. Uh, in fact, uh, in the time it was in place, we saw the wolf uh, population remain very stable, even though we had a hunting season. And then a year and a half or two years after the fact, uh, as uh, always happens on these things, uh, you know, we were sued, and then two years later, uh, a court in Washington, D.C. said, no question, the wolves have recovered, but we don't like your plan, and so they threw out the plan. So now we're still in court on it. We'll see what happens at the appellate court level. But what this does is it leads to a lot of consternation and some pushback on what should be a good news story. Uh, the Endangered Species Act shouldn't be a bad news story. And you've heard, and I've heard, and we don't subscri subscribe to this, but this theory of shoot, shovel, and shut up. And that's because, in part, people get so frustrated with trying to figure out what do we need to do to actually recover a species? How do we re reach the finish line? How do we get a species off the list after we have these great conservation efforts? And so uh, that's, I think, the, the gray wolf in particular. And I'm more familiar with Wyoming, although I know this isn't just a Wyoming story. It certainly has been a story in Idaho and Montana in Minnesota and other parts of the country. But when a species is more than fully recovered, you reach an agreement with all those people who sign off on these things, including the Secretary of Interior, yeah. and you still can't get it delisted. That's a problem. And it's a problem not only for the frustration it causes, but it's a problem because if we're focusing time, effort, and money on species that clearly have recovered, what species are we forgetting about and we're not spending time on? So it's not only bad in terms of what it causes, uh, you know, it's uncertainty in terms of our industry and businesses. It's bad for species. We're focusing, you know, we've won the game with wolves. We should, we should declare victory and we should go try to find the species that actually do need help and focus on them. But that's a question I, I've, I've always had about this is they had laid out at the time of the wolf reintroduction, it was laid out like what was an acceptable recovery. I mean, it was spelled out like numerically, am I right? I mean, we knew what recovery would look like, and that was passed a long time ago. The same with grizzly bears, I might add, yeah. That, 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 we've, that we've reached what would be recovery. Right, it's a moving goalpost. I think what's at, what's at stake, um, and, and I'm talking to listeners more than you, Governor, is, what, what's at stake, I think, with, with something like the Endangered Species Act, because I think that it winds up losing validity in the popular mind if it's seen as something that is a one-way road and not a tool. I mean, this is a horrible parallel, but I mean, it, you know, if you have a problem and you go into the hospital and your problem gets better, you go back home. It would be like, oh, no, you're going to stay here now and live at this hospital because you had that problem that one time. And I think that, that that's a problem we're running into with 
the Gray Wolf delisting is you have you've had a lot of people put a ton of time and energy into recovering this thing and now i don't know i think it's just i think it might be sort of an emotional thing where people have a hard time relinquishing the idea and turning it to state management and and the thing that everyone should realize that game generally like wildlife is generally administered on the state level so like here in wyoming for instance if 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 you have an elk right and he's on yellowstone national park and he jumps the fence and comes on to national forest land in Wyoming. And then he jumps another fence and he's on state land. And he jumps a fence, he's on county land. Then he jumps a fence and he's in a subdivision, okay? That elk has, throughout his journeys there, been property, like technically speaking, he's been property of the state of Wyoming. Various entities might control access to the thing, but the animal's owned by the state and is administered by the state. So when we talk about taking wolves or grizzly bears and handing them to the state, we're not, it's not like this novel experiment. You know, you're putting it like, I'll, you guys manage. We manage all the wildlife. You, have, you manage 11 right. big game species. Right, right. I think, yeah, I think I, I counted them up the other day in my head. 10 or 11 big game species are managed by the state of Wyoming in the state of Wyoming. So when people hear that you're going to let a state draw up a management plan for a species, I think that some people – I don't mean this as an insult because I've lived in many urban areas. I think a lot of times people in urban areas, they have concerns that they know about. You know, they have concerns that affect their daily lives and they just don't have the time and energy and inclination to study up on this kind of stuff that doesn't impact them daily. And when they hear that you're going to give management over to a state, I think that they feel like somehow something strange is happening. Right. Rather than you're returning to a norm. Right. You know. Yeah, I, that's a great point. I mean, the, the states do manage wildlife and... Uh, we have the expertise in it, we have the manpower, and we put the uh, resources to it. And so you're exactly right. What is out of the norm now is to have species that are not managed by the state, for example, wolves and grizzly bears. And it's, you know, part of the frustration is on the, on the uh, uh, recovery plan for the wolves, it's the state putting in the money and the time to get it done. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service puts in money as well. But we get sued by groups who don't put money on the ground to conserve yeah. the species. They put money in the lawyers' pockets uh, and in the, in the courtrooms. And so, you know, just the millions that we have spent to make sure we have a very strong, viable wolf population that shows that it's more than recovered, um, you know, that is properly in, on the state's lap. But we don't want just the burden of it. We want to be able to manage in a way in coordination and in uh, harmony with the rest of the wildlife that the state uh, uh, is required to and, and uh, wants to manage. All right, everyone. I know you're enjoying the Meat Eater podcast and you're especially enjoying it because it's free. And to keep it that way, we got to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. Hey, man, your season long fantasy football team might be going great. I don't know. But either way, you don't have to wait until, you know, the 16th week to get paid. You can put your fantasy skills to the test every week, all season long at DraftKings.com, America's favorite one-week fantasy football site. So when you roll with one-week fantasy, you don't have the season-long commitments. You know, like if you get a player and he's injured, it's not a problem because it's a new season every week. You just readjust. You're never stuck with the same dudes. And DraftKings is crowning a new millionaire every week this season. So if you're a big football guy, you could turn your adoration of football into a payday of a lifetime. You pick your players, you pile up your points, and you pick up your cash, and that's it. You have never done football like this before. This is not fantasy as usual. It's DraftKings. It's welcome to the big time. Now listen, go over DraftKings.com now and use the promo code MEAT, M-E-A-T, not like meat and ladies, M-E-E-T. It's meat like flesh and play for free with your first deposit on this Sunday's $1 million fantasy football contest. This Sunday, where first place is going to take home hundred grand. i am serious. Enter meat for free entry now only at DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. From your perspective as someone who's dealing with the, the, the ESA nonstop and dealing with the, the wolf issue, and I want to talk about the grizzly bear issue as well, but dealing with this, what are some things, like, like what do you feel are some things that could be done 
to make the process less like you hear the word litigious litigious thrown around all the time where it becomes a you know, these issues become these like, like a beach ball getting bounced back and forth in courts and there's no resolution. I mean, this has been how long this has been going on. Like we've like wolves have been genetically recovered in this area for a long time, a, a decade or more. Yeah. And there's still no end in sight to this. I mean, how would you ever, do you guys have ideas? Do you have thoughts about how someone would ever get it to be where there was just a, a, an actual end yeah. to the debate? Yeah. What, what would that even look like? Well, there, I think there's a couple things. One is I think it's easier to figure out where the goalpost is and how to get to the end by how you start the process. You know, right now to list a species is a relatively easy thing. I mean, the joke is you can do it on the back of an app. Can you send it to the Fish and Wildlife Service and you're on the list? And they already have 600 plus on the list uh, at the Fish and Wildlife Service. So here's some things that would be better. Uh, one is you can only list one species at a time. In other words, not multiple listings. I want to have all these things on the list. One species, before you do that, it requires state notification. It requires in, the data that the states have because we do have data, we do have the expertise. In other words, don't just throw something out there. Go ahead and look at what the science shows you. Look at one species, what the science shows you. Give the states notice, time for us to input, so that when it hits the Fish and Wildlife Services uh, desk, they have a proper vetting process. In other words, it's a package. They can look at it. They can make quicker decisions, more full decisions, rather than, hey, we're going to throw this out there, see if it sticks, uh, go through years of sort of discovery on what the science is there, then get into the court system, so on and so forth. In other words, there has to be, in my mind, a greater threshold before you even get on the, the list uh, so that we don't waste time, we don't waste money looking at species that shouldn't be on there. But I just interrupt you real quick, sorry. Isn't it true that, there, that the Fish and Wildlife Service is constantly getting sued because for not listing things, though. They are. They are. And uh, that's why, just if I can interject here, I, I think the, um, uh, as you know, as my initiative as chairman of the Western Governors Association is to see what improvements we can make to the Endangered Species Act. And if you talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service now, uh, depending upon who you talk to, uh, I think they recognize some of their rules and regulations would help offset that challenge that they face immediately by not listing uh, and also, I believe there's an opportunity for some statutory changes uh, that would also help support what Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to do and trying to do it in a proper way. So, I know I interrupted you, but, but, but continue on with the, unless you're done, about ideas and ways in which you would streamline the process. Are you saying that you could remedy the situation up front by, I would imagine too, by clarifying the goals of the listing? I think clarifying the goals will, will certainly help. And what we're trying to do with my Western Governors Initiative is around the West uh, get ideas and input from all all groups, sportsmen, wildlife groups, environmental groups, uh, to see what we think uh, we could do. Because reaching that goal post, knowing how to get there, what is a recovery plan, is important not just to reach the goal post, but if you say these five things, or these 20 things will help preserve a species, I want to know what it is because we want to do that. It's the right thing to do to preserve the species. If it's just this nebulous, keep trying this shotgun approach and hope someday a court agrees with you, then if you do get a court to agree with you, you don't even know if you've done the right things necessary for the species. So anything we could do beforehand to say, you know, here's how you go about this and here's how you reach the goal line, that not only is better for species and better for our businesses and industries, but it also allows us to go to the next step, to the next species, and start getting these off the list. Because uh, when you only have, since 1973, a little more than 1% who've ever gone on the list, off the list, that's the flip side of that 99%. Only 1% or so has ever gotten off the list. We're just adding to the list. What are we doing to recovery species? Every time there's a listing, it should be viewed as a failure. Every time there's a recovery and a species is sound, that should be celebrated as a victory, and we should move on to the next species. You know, it's funny because I remember with the bald eagle, it was treated as a victory. It was. It was a celebr. It's great. It was a great news story. It, it's yeah. It just boggled my mind the way that that people now view and look at, and the way that achievement was reached. That you just, I guess that animal just sparks different emotions than what's going on with the wolf thing where it's that so many people are there's just a tremendous reluctance to say okay in this you know biome right right in this biome we've 
achieved recovery. No one's arguing that you've achieved it across the whole thing. But I'll point out, 90% of elk, like we're not having a conversation right now about elk being an endangered species. 90% of elk habitat at the time of European contact has no elk, has no elk on it right now. Okay, so we're able to discuss animals in terms of with with a level of specific. I don't know, you know, regionality is a word, but with specific regionality, you know, elk are doing fantastic in many places. They're not doing fantastic in the southern portion of my home state of Michigan, which is absent of them. But people can in that way comprehend like, okay, yeah, you're hunting elk here even though they're absent here. But I think in a way that they look at the wolf issue, they, the wolf issue, they have a hard time fathoming that, yes, we have certain pockets where we've achieved objective. And that isn't commenting on where we're at in Arizona, in New Mexico. You know, I think that's another problem. And, I, and I'd be curious from you guys, have, have you found that drawing those borders in terms of state and national, is that cumbersome? You know, because I know that when you guys manage game, like how many game units is Wyoming divided into? Many. Depends on the species. I was recently hunting grizzly bears in British Columbia. British Columbia has, the, 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 has British Columbia divided into 60 management units. Okay, so they're able to make very precise decisions. Well, basically one sixtieth of the province at a time make very precise decisions about management goals. Some of those places have hunting, some don't reflected by what's going on on what's going on on the ground in those specific locations. And I think that that's a huge hang up that people have had about and, and I want to touch on grizzly bears too. A big hang up people have had on grizzly bears is yes, in some areas there's a lot of work that needs to be done. In some areas we've achieved goal. Why not say that it's achieved here and then like you said move on to some of the areas that haven't. Right. I, I think it's, you know, and grizzly bears and wolves are a good example. It's, you know, if we did everything exactly right in Wyoming with regard to wolves and grizzly bears, but Montana and Idaho were not, they would still be listed. It's, so it's, it's not just jurisdiction by, by state or county. It's, you know, the area, as you pointed yeah. out. And so in this area, Montana, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, those three states have to do a good job for that Yellowstone ecosystem population on managing the wolves. And so, but in that region, we know that the bears have more than fully recovered. And so does that mean we have to go and tell there's sufficient amount of bears in uh, uh, around Denver, Denver metropolitan area? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it, it, you have to understand where there's uh, the habitat for these populations. Uh, and then make sure that they're doing well in those in those areas where there's proper habitat for them. So keeping in mind some of these things we're talking about, do you mind doing a similar breakdown you did with wolves on, on, on the grizzly bear issue and where it stands and what it might mean for outdoorsmen and you know people beyond Wyoming, but certainly inclusive of Wyoming? Yeah, well, I just, uh, you know, when we, get, when we had the wolves uh, delisted, um, you know, I view that as a great victory, not only for us as a state, but frankly, for the species, the wolves. And as soon as that was done, we had developed through that process a good factual working relationship with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Secretary of Interior. And so as soon as that was completed, I wrote uh, the Secretary a letter and said, you know, now grizzly bears need to be legally listed. And uh, in fact, I had gotten some letters about that time saying, hey, thanks uh, for your efforts on the wolves, but frankly, grizzlies are a better uh, or, or a more serious problem in terms of conflict, in terms of not having the balance in the wildlife uh, in, in the greater Yellowstone uh, area. So we got on it right away, and here we are three, four years later, and we see that the grizzly bears are not delisted. Um, in 2010, uh, there, there was an attempt to delist the grizzly bears, and the court, as they do, say, well, uh, it's pointed out to us that uh, whitebark pine populations going down that habitat, and that's one of the food sources for grizzly bears. And therefore, we're not going to approve the delisting because we're concerned that they're not going to have the food sources. And what we've shown since that court decision is the white bark pine has been going down in terms of available white bark pine. Grizzly bear population has been inversely going up. Grizzly bears, as you know, probably better than I firsthand, uh, they, are, they are good eaters and they can eat just about anything. And the grizzly bear population has continued to go up. And so as those numbers have gone up, despite the white bark pine not being as prevalent, 
Uh, again, we're at this point where there's no question it should be delisted. And I made that clear to Secretary Salazar and I think it was 2011, and we're hopeful now, uh, um, perhaps at the end of this year, that we can actually make some good movement on that. If that happens, do you feel that it'll it'll <clears throat> turn into the same never-ending cycle of like retributional lawsuit? Yeah, we're we're, we're worried about <laughs> it because that's that's the pattern we see, and you know I understand. I mean, uh, people have uh, you know people get. Uh, emotional about specific species um you know you don't you don't hear people worrying about carp uh, yeah you don't hear them worrying about rattlesnakes but there are some species that uh, they get very concerned about and grizzly bears or wolves because they view it beyond just the individual species and it's iconic of the west and iconic of um you know people put spiritual value on, on some of those species i appreciate that they have that perspective but they also need to know for the benefit of those species, uh, the best way for their survival is one, public support, two, to have the state manage them, and three, have them in an equilibrium uh, fashion uh, coexist with the other species. Uh, because I can tell you that if you know grizzly bears and wolves wipe out the entire moose population or uh, elk population, and I'm not saying that's happening, but if that happened, I think it's some. This this is me talking from like just observation and talking to many people. I think in some areas with moose, it's it's precarious almost. It is well in some areas. We we see that. I mean, it's my exaggerated point was if they wipe them all out. Yeah, that, that's yeah, what, that's what I'm saying. It's not happening. But there's no question. We see the moose population declining. We see uh, the elk uh, being struggling. We see uh, also, you know. Uh, you know the the numbers of human conflict and the number of human deaths by grizzly bears is going up i mean it's not a big number but the rate is an exponential growth rate and you talk to hunters and maybe you've seen this as well the gunshot is a dinner bell yeah they, they hear a gunshot and that's why people want to hunt with suppressors in part because when they hear the when the grizzly bears hear the the gunshot go off that means there's a gut pile there that means there's food there and so you see the the tragedy of uh, people getting killed more and more by grizzly bears. So I think there is in all this, you have to have the bal balance. And in today's world, you also have to have management. And as you pointed out rightfully, that historically and rightfully is in the state's hands. You know, we've, we've touched on a couple of things of, of things that I, I would think of as being undecided. Um, I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with how things have gone there's no end in sight it's been kind of a uh, like a systemic failure i would say with with my personal opinion about wolf and grizzly management just how it's gone the way those animals have been used um as sort of pawns in the game about what our relationship is with the natural world but last week i think it was a week ago and i might have lost track of time there, there was a case where you know we had the, the greater sage grouse was being considered for Endangered Species Act protection. Um, a, a, a lot of people agreed that that would, ha, had they gotten that level of protection, and they're an animal of the of, of the sage flats, had they gotten that protection, it would have had huge economic implications. It would have had implications for absolutely for hunters and fishermen, land managers of all sorts, industry across the board. It would have had big implications for them because had they gotten ESA listing, it would have really had um, – it would have changed business in, in quite a few states, six or seven states. Um, and that way the ESA had teeth because people knew what to be afraid of. But rather than going down the road of listing and just acting like this is an inevitable thing, a bunch of conservation groups – I know, Governor, your own office – the offices, the, the governor's offices of several other states really pulled together and did a dramatic turnaround on that bird and habitat as well. Can you talk a little bit about how that battle kind of took shape and how it reached what seems to be like resolution? And I know now it might not be, you know, the, the lawsuits will get rolling. But, but, but do you mind talking a little bit about kind of where your stance on that has been and what kind of work you guys have done there? Yeah, well, the, um, you're absolutely right. If the sage grouse would have been listed, it would have affected uh, uh, 
many states uh, uh, in a substantial way, but the West and, and, and frankly the country. And I say the country because, you know, if the bird wouldn't have been listed in Wyoming, and Wyoming, as you probably know, exports more energy than any other state, uh, oil, gas, coal, uranium, uh, we're really big in that. Uh, we export more coal than any other state. Had the bird been listed, you look at historical range, where the bird not necessarily is now, but where it has ever been. And we looked at that, and it would have virtually shut down all the coal mining in the state. And that coal mining, you say, well, that's great for Wyoming, but we supply coal to over 30 states, and they get the benefit of low-cost energy from that coal. The same with oil and the same with gas. With what we were able to work out, rather than having uh, virtually 80% of the coal shut down, uh, now we manage it so the coal is not shut down. The same with oil and gas. About uh, 66% of the oil and gas production would have been shut down. Now it's limited to 5%. So that's on the good industry news front. But on the wildlife front, uh, my predecessor, Governor Friedenthal, did a very good job putting together diverse groups. I mean, you have Audubon Society out there. Uh, with ranchers, with uh, industry folks, trying to figure out how to go about doing this. How to not shut the state down, but at the same time, make sure you preserve the habitat for sage grouse uh, so that we can know that they're going to be viable. And so this work uh, started before I came into office and continued uh, with my great staff uh, while I've been in office in cooperation with Fish and Wildlife Service, the Secretary's office, many conservation groups, as I said, ranchers. And we came to a point, as you pointed out, where the Fish and Wildlife Service says, because of the plans that we have in place, that is the states, uh, that the bird does not, it's not warranted to be listed. And this is a great victory, but it is not, uh, it, there's certainly the teeth was in the Endangered Species Act, but what we did, the model that we have set up here, is not because of the Endangered Species Act, it's because we're trying to find answers. We're trying to preserve uh, habitat, we're trying to preserve species, and we're trying to do it in a way that doesn't shut down their states. We're not a zoo. I mean, we have to put food on the table like any other state. And so, it, I, in terms of that bird not being listed, I think it's not only a great victory for the bird, but hopefully, uh, to answer your earlier question, it is a model on how to go forward where you can reach the finish line with multiple uh, diverse interests coming together and saying we've got to find an answer. Uh, it's good for the species and it's good for business. So I'm hoping, uh, one, that uh, it doesn't get thrown out by the courts and then two, uh, that we can use it to how to address uh, other species in a grand scale. The good news on the sage grouse is that by conserving that habitat, uh, we know it's also going to help other species that uh, rely upon the habitat, the same habitat the sage grouse do. That, that's, that issue might be one of the more complicated ones that, that I've followed because I, when I was first came, when I was first introduced to the, to the sage grouse issue, it was through a, a friend of mine who's a biologist with uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And he came forward and was talking about how catastrophic he felt that listing was going to be. And so it was kind of, it was kind of funny. I think a lot of people have a hard time sort of wrapping their heads around the idea that like, here's the, here's a guy from a conservation organization saying, no, 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 this isn't the best thing. This isn't the best thing. Like listing isn't the best thing for the ESA. Listing isn't the best thing for land managers. It's going to bring a lot of animosity. This guy continued to hunt sage grouse through the whole thing. Right. You know, because he was like, it's not a hunting issue. Like, I think that hunting is, it has big economic factors. It incentivizes people on land issues. And you wind up where if you had to go and explain this to someone completely outside of this world, you'd have a very difficult time going, um, it's in the better interest to the bird to not get listing. And it's in the better interest of the bird for sportsmen to maintain a renewed, albeit very limited through the you know, legal means, interest in pursuing this bird. Right. And it's going to keep this bird sort of woven into the culture of the West and have it not become a spotted owl. Right, right. You know, I, I think it's I, I, that is such an important point you make because it's it it invests people in seeing these species are taken care of, and you know, people would be surprised if you said, you know, how many sage grouse are we talking about? Were they, you know, what are we down to a thousand or five thousand? 
Well, in Wyoming alone, there's in excess of 100,000 of these birds. And we do have a hunting season on them. And people say, how do you have a hunting season? Well, it's we look at the risks to sage-grouse, and a hunting season is not a risk to the sage-grouse because they're, we have such a healthy, robust population. But I think it's one of the reasons I think, uh, you know, on a broader scale, it's so important to recognize the value in hunting and the conservation that comes from hunting. Uh, not only uh, for those who hunt, but it is the sportsman who puts so much back into seeing species, whether it's fish or wildlife, maintain these healthy populations. It's why groups like the Audubon Society were leading our charge and trying to get us to this point, because they saw that in the broad picture, it would be better for the species not to be listed. Yeah. What do you feel now? Now, when people look at the arrangement, and it's a complex arrangement, are you guys are you comfortable trying trying to like sum up what what the recover? I know it's even called a recovery plan, but now we have a quarter million. We're looking at a quarter million birds in in, in the sagebrush areas of the West. But is there like how would you sum up like what the plan is? Well, I guess at the core of it in Wyoming is uh, we have core areas. In other words, where there's high concentration of of the bird and in those areas there is much greater restriction than outside those areas that's one and then two uh, if there's a disturbance uh, to a core area where there's a multiple lex for example you have to offset that disturbance in some way somewhere else that will benefit the bird uh, so at the the key to the plan is the the sage grouse core areas where we recognize there's high concentration of birds and that there, we have to be extra careful in those areas with what we do with any type of development but there's areas outside there that would have little or no effect and those are the areas say hey you want to uh, put in a new housing development or you have a chance for an oil and gas development because it's outside of those areas that would have uh, much impact on their habitat we can go ahead and do that as long as we're extra careful in these areas uh, where there's a concentration of birds. And this this quarry strategy we know is working. Now there's a lot of variables that go into population as you know, but we will point out that since 2013, the increase in the male lex, which is how we count birds as best as we can, has gone up exponentially. Just in Wyoming, for example, the, the males uh, from uh, increased greatly in 2014 and from 2014 to 2015 over a 50 percent increase um, now fires can change that and you know, bad weather can change that but the core area strategy is working yeah that that's a an interesting thing you bring up like the fires and weather is anyone who pays attention to who follows upland birds in any way knows just the implications of of drought an ill-timed hailstorm right can put you into serious Right. Trouble. So I imagine now there's a lot of people sitting around will probably during like the laying time for the greater sage grouse be watching the weather very carefully because you could like numerically diminish the bird without anything happening to habitat. You could also be like, okay, now we're back down to, you know, for factors completely beyond our control. Right. Down down to a danger spot. All right. Land and water conservation fund. Can we, t- can we ask you about this as well? Yeah. I know we, been- we, got, we got Nephi here. He's an expert on it. He's, that was what he majored in in college, or at least that's what he told me. I want, just, just quick right now, because this, this, is, the most, this is one of the most important things, I think, that affect people who like to spend the time outdoors that, that they've never heard of. Um, I'm going to do a similar run down here just to, to, to get people up to speed that it was, it's, it's been around since 1965. What happens is, you know, offshore drilling, offshore oil drilling. So it's occurring... Um, on what would be land, you know, it's like land owned by the American populace, okay, but it's not deeded to any particular entity. It's just like government land. And when people go and extract oil off there, they're essentially paying a fee to the American people um, for the ability to extract that oil. Some of that money is put toward grants and matching funds to federal and state agencies. And it's earmarked. It's intended purpose is for use in public access and land acquisition. I'm talking everything from parks, scenic overlooks, beaches, mountain ranges, you name it. Um, Land and Water Conservation Fund money has secured over 7 million acres of land. This is not taxpayer money, okay? I mean, it's money that goes into a federal budget, but it's not coming out of your taxes. It's been renewed one time. 
So the first time they put it in, it was good for 25 years. At the end of that 25 years, it got renewed for another 25 years. And it just so happens that if you're alive right now, you have to be alive, you know, during one of the years when it would need to be renewed. And it seems like a no-brainer that it would get renewed, but it's stalled. Um, it, it's hard to say. There are people who don't, uh, there are people out there who don't like it because they just have a general antipathy toward, I guess, the antipathy toward the government owning and managing land for, for public use. I think that's at play. But largely, it's just kind of held up in budgetary squabbling. It's a casualty. Nephi, is that fair to say that it's like it not being renewed right now has more to do with just budgetary issues in general than it has to do with the Land and Water Conservation Fund? You know, I, it'd be tough for me to talk about what issues specifically you know, they're talking about on the Hill's relation to it, but it would be fair to say that, you know, as a priority, there's huge bipartisan support for reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I think what you're running into is people would like to make sure that the original intent of that act is honored. You know, originally the Land and Con- Water Conservation Fund, you had about 60% of the money uh, by rule go into the states to make decisions on that. And, and in Wyoming, that's done things like, you know, and in, in every community, if you're listening to this, you've got a community pool, you've got a ballpark, you have nature trails, you have work that's been done on your, you know, you've got your river walk, you know, all those projects are projects that, you know, in every state, in every community, there are LWCF projects. Oh, boat, boat access. Like boat if, you, access. if you launch your boat into a river off or you see a little sign like public launch and everything else around there is private, that money, that landing get donated. And, and I think it's fair to say that folks right now, you know, at this opportunity, when they're talking about reauthorization, they want to have a robust discussion about whether or not the real, the, the intent of the act is still being it being met and to ensure that it is being met. And I know, um, you know, Governor Mead and, and the other governors have weighed in on this and, and said that that's important, that there's important that there's integrity in funding, that there, it's important that states have an opportunity to do what we believe that local communities and states do best. You know, typically people, whether you're talking about species, whether you're talking about land, the people who live closest to the issues on the ground typically are the people who can come up with the best solutions. They can identify how to spend money in an efficient way. You know, conservation is a huge priority in Wyoming. We, you know, tourism is our number three industry in this state. Number two industry, I apologize. Agriculture is our number three industry. And uh, when people come to Wyoming, they come here to, you know, they come here because of the lands that they see. They come here because of our outdoor recreational opportunities. And I think like most of the West, we recognize that, uh, you know, conservation is a huge priority to us. And I think it's, you know, appropriate that there's a robust, robust discussion on making sure that it's being done the right way. And I think that that's reflected in people's thoughts on land and water conservation fund, both on the amount of hu- the amount of bipartisan support for its reauthorization, but also on the fact that some members uh, up on the Hill want to take a good look at it and want to make sure that it's getting, you know, spent in the right way, that the, that the dollars are going to where they should go, and that ultimately states uh, get to innovate with some of that money, get to look at conservation easements themselves, and uh, get to have a say in how that money's spent. All right, everyone. I know you're enjoying the Meat Eater podcast, and you're especially enjoying it because it's free. And to keep it that way, we got to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. I'm going to talk about something that's been a headache for me for years before, and that's getting a website. Like when I was starting out with my career as a writer and, and, and doing TV stuff and book stuff and magazine stuff, getting like a up-to-date website that looked good, you know, and worked. And so that I could show people what I was doing and and get more work. It was just a hassle, you know, and and I spent a ton of money and wasted time, wasted money on it. It's just tough to make a website. And even if you know how to code, like if you miraculously know how to code, it's still hard, you know, to make something that's good and works well without sucking up tons of your time. Um, but you got to have it, man. Like whether it's for, you know, if you got a business site, you got a portfolio of your artwork, you got a restaurant, whatever else in this day and age, you got to have a website if you're going to do any good. And you know, lucky for us, you go on Squarespace and they make it easy to build great websites without causing you, you know, to break out in a sweat. Squarespace provides simple, powerful and beautiful services to make a website that looks professionally designed, regardless of how good you are at that kind of stuff. No coding required. And not only does Squarespace provide you with 
a pretty intuitive and easy to use tools to create your website with. They also have state-of-the-art technology that powers your site. So it's secure and you got good stability on it. And you know you can trust in Squarespace for your website needs because millions of people already do. And some of the most respected brands in the world use Squarespace. You cannot beat, I'm telling you, you can't beat the ease and simplicity of Squarespace. They give you 24-7 online support, a beautiful website, 8 bucks a month. You get a free domain name if you buy Squarespace for the year. So there's no reason to wait around here. Start a trial with no credit card required, and you can go and start building your website. It means you can check it out and start building it without paying for it up front to see if you like it or not. When you decide to sign up, make sure to use the offer code MEATEATER to get 10% off your first purchase. And also, you're showing your support for the Meat Eater podcast, which helps us uh, keep alive and well. I want to thank Squarespace for their support of the Meat Eater podcast, and you should do the same by checking it out. Squarespace, build it beautiful. What will happen if it doesn't get renewed? I think you have a short term and a long term. So right now, the money from that, it, there's a trust and the money's there. And uh, I think, you know, I'm not, that's in the long term. Um, in the long term, the very, very long term, it, it could go away. Uh, in the short term, you know, people are going to continue working with it on, you know, the way that it is. It, it's interesting when you bring that up, the, the Endangered Species Act uh, hasn't been re- reauthorized in many, many years, but you know, you can see that the Endangered Species Act, it's, it's still there. It just, but, but it wasn't, but it wasn't set to be finite, right? Or was it? I'm not sure as far as finite, you mean the Land and Water Conservation Fund? Or no, the Land Species and Water Act? Conservation Fund was good for 25 years and it got renewed for 25 years. So, you know, Dave's going to have to jump in here with me on this one, to, but in general, these, you know, these acts, they do have a time frame on them. They have a, you know, a, I don't know if sunset's the right word because the act doesn't go away, but they, you know, they, they have a, a situation where there's an anticipated date where you're going to come back and take a look at it. If changes are not made, it continues status quo. Yeah. Um, but, but when that date hits, it's an opportunity to take a look at those acts and to see, you know, that was the way that they were designed is that there would be changes to them that, that, you know, as we grow as a, you know, as a nation, you know, we update those things for the future. So do you think it's going to get, uh, do you think it'll, I know it's hard to predict this, but will that funding come back and we'll continue to be able to make improvements with public access and, and do these kind of things? I, I think conservation is too important to everybody in the nation that for, for people not to, to work on that issue. And I don't think any of us, you know, sitting around this table know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but I think that it, I think I anticipate it being there. Yeah. I hope that people take the time to notify their representatives and let them know how they feel about it. Because like you're saying, it is just a bipartisan issue that seems to have overwhelming support, you know, and it's important for sportsmen. I I just wish they would get it. You know, I, I hope they get it squared away. I trust that they'll get it squared away. Um, run out a little bit of time, but I got a couple of things. Governor, got, there, there's two main things. One, you got to make it that, um, that wilderness lands aren't closed to non-resident hunters. <laughs> <laughs> this should be the main thing <laughs> you work on. Okay, I got it. <laughs> hang on, hang on. My crayon's broken. I need a pen. <laughs> okay. The other thing that would be helpful, to be honest, is if there's a state law that everybody had to buy a hunt to eat T-shirt. <laughs> Giannis, do you have any? Uh, you've been quiet through this whole thing. <clears throat> you got any observations or questions, Giannis? Not in particular. Um, Giannis and I live the wolf issue. Um, nonstop through questions that come in from viewers of the show and listeners and people who are trying to make sense out of something that seems like a pretty complex issue. And it is very difficult. I've found it very difficult to explain. My kid the other day asked where planets come from. It would be easier to explain that (laughs) than the wolf issue. But you don't, so you don't have, uh, 
You don't have concluding thoughts, Giannis? Oh, I didn't know we were starting on concluding thoughts. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you know, we have limited time with the governor, and we've used it up. So if you have uh, you lay some concluding thoughts, everybody gets a chance to do concluding thoughts. It's, tr- it's a tradition here. Does someone else have them right at the tip of their tongue would like to start? <laughs> yeah, concluding, concluding thoughts? thoughts. This is a man who hasn't spoken a word yet. Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty proud of uh, of not having anything to say. That means the governor did a great job. The man <laughs> talking right now used to be the um, – you were, you were one of the lead lawyers or the lead lawyer for Wyoming Fish and Game? Yeah, I represented the Wyoming Game and Fish for a number of years. Had some interesting stories. There were some fun stories there, yeah. yeah. Rourke, you got any concluding thoughts? Uh, Qu- he- you, can be, you can take the form of a question. No, I mean, I, you know, when I when I hear the conversation, I mean, it, it does uh, it, it it reminds me of of things we wrestle with in the military, and, and and the thing that I love about this conversation is that you know the state's autonomy throughout the country, I think, is such a uh, a critical part of who we are as a country, and 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 that the folks, as we were saying, the boots on the ground know what's going on in their terrain. I mean, the the, the number of times my teammates and I were in some austere inexplicable cultural region in the world that that no one really had good perspective on other than the folks living there and then us that were standing there and trying to communicate that back to a leadership and say hey this decision we know needs to be made and then get pushed back or some type of an argument for somebody that's sitting in you know an air conditioned office trying to trying to tell you how to do your job would make you an absolute crazy person trying to yeah. trying to affect change that you know what it takes so when i hear any issue that's coming from the folks that are in my mind the trigger pullers the people that that live it every day it's uh it's unbelievably frustrating to see that those voices aren't the the, the absolute you know, flag bearers, because th- those are the folks that understand it. Those are the ones that are there. So uh, it's been a treat to listen to the governor talk about uh, this within this state. And I, I would I would imagine all the Western state governors know the exact same. They know what they need. They know what needs to happen in their own backyard. And I, and I think uh, the support needs to be there for it. So uh, those are my thoughts. You know, I understand the frustration. Well put, Rourke. Nephi, concluding thoughts? You know, I think... Um, I think all of us agree, and I think this is the exciting part when you start talking about these issues. I believe that there's wide consensus for the importance of conservation, wildlife, and opportunities to go out and enjoy it. And I think, you know, talking about these issues, too often I think we let uh, divisiveness rule the day. And uh, I think we're, we have a unique opportunity in America right now, and, and certainly here in Wyoming we recognize that opportunity to kind of bring everybody back to the center and say, hey, let, let's look, take a look at these things that are important to all of us and let's make sure that they work and that we project into the future the values that are important to us and that we you know, make sure that our you know, kids have places to recreate, we have healthy wildlife populations and that we have an opportunity to enjoy these things. And I think uh, that for me has been the exciting you know, part and the, and the part where it's been a privilege to work with the governors because uh, I know that that's uh, – that's consensus around, you know, the people that I get an opportunity to work with is recognizing that importance. And it's just, just, it's a really sharp group and it's a privilege to work on those issues and uh, to work with him on those issues. Yeah. That's one of the, I see that I get this, this will stand in as my concluding thought. It's a two part one, one, um, watching some of these issues. It is nice to see that there are some people out there who are striving for compromise and, and going for a consensus. I think that the, the divisiveness around some of these wildlife issues comes down to, um, and, and I'm in many ways guilty of this myself, um, and I try to correct it all the time. It comes down to where you're putting together your worldview based on very limited conversations that you were having with a very limited group of people, and you're, you, you end up existing in these little echo chambers. And if people would take the time so, and I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone. This is not preaching. But take the time to go and really educate yourself, yourselves about issues. Like if we're going to take the gray wolf thing. Really educate yourself about the history of that species, where that species exists now, where things stand. Get out a map. Try to study the map. Think about population dynamics. Look at numbers. Look at trends. And dig a little deeper than what you know, your buddy at the bar might have told you. Um, it's so hard to do, but it's so rewarding you know, when you take the time to do it. Um, Governor, 
you, you get to you get to conclude with your concluding thoughts. So this oh, is a powerful well, moment. Well, okay, well I'll do my best. Well, let me. I I, I do want to say, starting out, uh, what uh, how grateful I am that uh, you all are here and are covering this issue and. Rourke, it's great to have you here. Thank you for your service. What, what, what an honor to have you here uh, with us. Really appreciate that. Um, I think it's been well said, but, you know, um, uh, we can get to, in those echo, echo chambers, but I do think there is a common perspective that uh, most of us have, and we think about the next generation. And I started this conversation thinking about uh, talking about my great-grandparents, and my great-grandfather used to say in Wyoming, where you find one blade of grass leap two and he was a ranch guy but it's a theme that goes beyond ranching and it goes to each of us have an obligation to leave the place a little better than we found it and we think about that not only in terms of just our legacy uh, as citizens but we think about it in terms of our our uh, work as parents you know i want this place to be special for my kids and grandkids and so on and so forth and all of you do as well and so conservation is something that is critical and as a state with the first national park and the first national monument um, you know we take that very seriously in Wyoming and as Rourke said we think we have expertise on it and not only do we just claim that uh, it's not a boast uh, look at the state of Wyoming and look and see what we have done and see our history 125 years and we put an emphasis on that uh, and seeking that balance and seeking the right way to go because in the end <clears throat> when we leave these jobs that we have we want to be able to say you know hopefully we have done our part to leave that next blade of grass hopefully we've done that part so that you know 50 years from now my kids will be teaching their uh, kids or maybe their grandkids uh, that first hunt and the ethics that goes with that and the appreciation for the outdoors, the appreciation for the West and all that it brings, not just to those of us who are fortunate to live here, but how proud we are to show it off to the rest of the nation and the rest of the world. And it's a special trust that we have and we're obligated to preserve it. And uh, nobody has a greater vested interest in seeing that it's done right uh, than those of us who live here and certainly me as governor want to make sure that I do my part in that so thank you both for being here <clears throat> great issue and I thought I was going to be able to talk about my alligator hunt <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to talk about getting sprayed with a skunk here a couple of weeks ago I lived in a ranch my whole life I've never been sprayed by a skunk I got just I was like ground, right? ground zero bingo and my wife wouldn't let me in the house right out here I'm, were you here yeah, yeah right out right outside our window I was just where was security <laughs> That's a damn good question. I did. So no, I went out the sliding glass door, and you know we have these little rabbits, and I like seeing the little rabbits, and I heard a little bush move, and I, oh, there's gonna be a little rabbit down there. <laughs> Just a direct hit. So I come in the house. My wife's like, "Get out of here!" And I'm like, well, "What am I to do? I'm like, I'm, I'm homeless now. What do I? What do, you, what do, you do? I got hosed by my own pepper spray. You did <laughs> bear spray. <laughs> I've now. I, I really. This so is it, gonna. This is a lot of like. So it's not an automatic aim on those. It's just <laughs> well. It was on my belt. It was on my belt. I threw. I was going through some thick brush. The the threw the switch. <laughs> depressed the button. It, it's like I, I'm just trying. I mean, I know. I know. Consensus is on pepper spray, and, and I know this is gonna drive a lot of people nuts. But I have now. <laughs> If you factor the number of days that you actually spend with pepper spray, I have been witness to three pepper spray accidents. <laughs> I'm really, it's like I've been charged by one grizzly and I've seen three pepper spray accidents. Um, that's an accidental discharge, isn't it? That was that. Yeah. It is. It is it's an AD. A A D. Yeah. I'm telling you that I'm doing some real soul searching about my uh, my relationship with pepper spray. I decided a long time ago about my relationship with skunks, but uh, <laughs> um, and you, you, you feel free. To share about your alligator hunt, I don't, I'm not here to cut you off. You're here to cut <laughs> oh, me off. No, well, oh. I, I I said that in jest, but I did have <clears throat> all the hunting I've done, and you know the hunting I do with my daughter and my son, and it's all in the West. But I did have occasion to go to Florida once and hunt alligators with a buddy of mine who was raised in Wyoming, and then he moved to Florida, and uh, in his words, in short order, became a real expert in alligator hunting and in bolt building, and so <laughs> <laughs> he built this. <laughs> He built this boat that um, 
you know, we're going across the water, and it's you go out at night, as you know, and you go out and to the bottom of the boat's moving, and I, I have a fear of snakes, and so <laughs> as we're going and we're getting further, and then there's bushes on the side. I'm trying to decide, you know, work. I'm trying to say worst case scenario. Do I get in the water or do I get on land with the snakes? Right. I never, never got that. And then you get out the spotlight, you know, and that's how you see them. You see those red eyes and you have a crossbow to get them. And uh, uh, the guy I was with, he got, uh, he went back the next trip and got a huge alligator. But for me from the west where you get natural and then all of a sudden you have spiders and you have snakes and you have glowing red eyes, uh, it made it, it made, uh, you know, a skunk look like, just a smelly nuisance, not, yeah. just, not <laughs> something that's good. So that's a long way of saying you're not wearing alligator skin boots right now. No, that was the other thing. Is, you know, I, t <laughs> I talked to my wife about, hey, can I go? And, and then uh, I came back. I didn't get an alligator. And um, she was like, I thought you were going to, I was going to get a purse. I was, what's, what's the deal? I sent you out there for three days. You came back empty handed. So I'll go back one day. Um, Rourke, you just did some hunting. You want to quickly share? And then we're really going to end this podcast. No, no. I, so I've got a couple more shots, but a friend invited me that uh, he played football out, uh, out at Syracuse, which is where I played lacrosse. He's been hunting a canyon uh, outside of Steamboat up in the Zirkel Wilderness area for 15 years. They've you had just said more than I would have said. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I go to I'm still I say what state. <laughs> no, you're right. So you're right. You're right. Nonetheless, this guy's had tremendous success. That was in success. Wyoming, you said? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, tremendous success. You know, they've, they've seen it. And, and rarely seen other people. When we showed up for the hunt, there you know nine vehicles at this trailhead that even give us access to this region. So I think he was automatically dejected when we got there that we we're going to see more folks. We didn't see any other people, but we also didn't see a whole lot of elk. We got one cow close, and it was my first archery hunt, so I was I was very excited, and uh, I'm I'm definitely taken by it. I'll be I'll be hunting with a bow for life again, but I'll I'll also go with uh, other means. But uh, I've got a couple more chances before the the season ends. We'll see. Did you you got a little little excitement you know it's funny that i've had several people take t take me on hunts they're like you're not gonna be able to control you know, you know your emotions i said i feel like i got a decent shot unless an elk shows up with a with an rpg and, then, and that wouldn't be the first time i saw that either so I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens yeah. Yeah. you know you joke about telling people your hunting spot um my brother one of his pack llamas is missing out of Riggs, idaho and he was trying to get me to online uh, somehow let slip that my favorite elk hunting spot was right where his llama's missing, thinking that the huge influx of people, <laughs> <laughs> that one of those guys would turn his llama up, um, but it's still missing. So if you're out by Riggs, Idaho, and you see a llama running around, its name's Maggie, um, put, some, uh, put some marbles in a coffee can and shake it, and Maggie will come running up grab it it's my brother's he's offering a reward um thanks for listening in again governor mead thank you so much for coming on very generous of your time um that's it tune in next time hey listen up this sounds like an advertisement but it's not it's different than an ad i need you guys and gals that listen to go check out the complete guide to hunting butchering and cooking wild game which is written by myself and some people from the meat eater team and a collection of the best hunters from around the country. It's a two volume set. Volume one, big game is coming out in August. Volume two, small game comes out in December. Again, it's called the complete guide to hunting, butchering and cooking wild game. It totals about 750 pages of content dealing with gear, tags, hunting basics, advanced hunting strategies, field butchering, recipes, everything you need to know to be a better hunter or to get started in hunting if you haven't done it before. If I had had this book when I was a kid, it would have changed my life. It's going to change yours. I'm not joking. You can pre-order now, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Target, Powell's, Walmart, wherever books are sold. It's out there. It's beautiful. It's huge. It's two volumes. Do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Give this book a look.